We've spoken about a conversation I had with a friend. And I'm not meaning to accuse my friend of anything. But they're speaking of a lot of the questions that people have in the movement. Some are more outspoken with these views than others. But most of them do not speak to me. Instead it comes through other people or is shared on our chat groups. So I'm addressing the, not just their conclusions, but the whole train of thought. Now my, my sister has questions. She's framed some of this as a question. But most of it, she's just stating what she believes. And then challenging me to prove her incorrect. So I don't really believe it's a question. And she's starting from two premises I don't agree with. I don't agree with them because they go directly against what we see in lions. The first one point that we addressed was her concept that say that Christ creates a system to reflect that of the world. To win the world. We've demonstrated how that's incorrect. The other premise is the following. In a time period of scattering, God's people have rules and reforms to keep everything stable. Then when you come into a time period of gathering, God's people have to reflect his character so those reforms change and now we no longer have morality, now we have prophecy. And now, because it's a gathering time, it's in a gathering that we start to reflect. God has to set up a system reflective of the world. So that the two concepts are closely linked. The first concept, God will, through different dispensations, sets up a movement that can reflect the world to win the world. The second premise, we have rules in a scattering time, but this change in God's people occurs in a gathering time, which is why, going back to our own concepts, something like the Sabbath, it's good to have those rules in a scattering time. But when you come to a gathering, what's the purpose of these rules or reforms? When they just prevent us from reflecting the world. And it's clear that our Sunday law test was about equality. We know that at Daniel 11.41, the test will have 
that similar concept, equality. And how can we bring to people any other test than what God has ordained? The chief subject of attack being our vows. So, I believe we've proven the first concept incorrect. That whole concept of reflecting the world. God does not create a counterfeit system, Satan does. Therefore, anything in the world that seems similar to God's people, they reflect us. We don't reflect them. We don't change to fit them. They may change to fit us. But that's a one-sided transaction. The second point. In the time period of scattering, you have to have all these firm rules and reforms. I ask for one example. Over an hour and a half conversation, I'm still waiting on my one example. You can give multiple examples where that is not correct. Come to the captivity in Egypt. In the captivity, are they keeping all the rules and reforms? No. In the scattering, in the captivity, they are not keeping the reforms. God takes them out of Egypt and all of a sudden you have to dress a certain way. You have to eat a certain way. You have to practice one uniform system of worship. You have to keep the Sabbath. Rules come in. In fact, those rules seem so severe to them Many of them miss the scattering time. They want to go back into captivity to Egypt because in Egypt they felt they had more freedom. They could eat what they wanted. They had their leeks, their onions, their meat. They didn't have these uncomfortable reforms. Second witness. 1260 years. Now the model my sister presented is for a scattering time. I know I'm oversimplifying her words, but a gathering time is for freedom. Because freedom is God's character. If you follow that logic, you would have to say in the 1260, it's all about reforms, rules, Sabbath keeping, and then the Millerites, they're going to reflect the world. Those identifiable aspects of Christianity, of Adventism, become no longer relevant. But we know that's not the story. 
In the 1260, they eat what they want. There's no prophet to tell them otherwise. There's no prophet to say you won't eat meat. They'll dress how they want. There's no prophet to say you will not wear that. They don't keep the Sabbath. They do not have a structured set of, of rules, of reforms. So on those two witnesses, there's a problem with her other premise. So that aside, we discussed their concept of the harvest. One test. Equality. You pass that test. You have passed the test of the Sunday law. Pass the test equals saved. No other man-made rule can be given to them using their words what they call man-made tests which they're applying to every test that isn't the singular test of the dispensation or of the reform line so you pass equality, you're saved. Conservatives have already failed. They're lost. The liberals have passed. They're saved. So we spent this morning's presentation building up to one key liberal. The Pope. Papa. When you follow their train of thought, and you see everything Pope Francis is fighting for, you understand why these same people are saying Pope Francis is an ethnym. And they're wording it like a question. Maybe Pope Francis will be an ethnym. It sounds innocent. But their thinking behind it, the concepts they're pushing, are dangerous. They are not innocent. And if you think September last year was life and death, the movement being challenged now, it's a life and death issue. So I'm going to put over here one of these liberals is Pope Francis. Papa Francis. But what he believes, you know, is it true liberality? Or is it counterfeit liberalism? Because now you have a problem. So we'll come back to the line of the Nathanims which we've lined up with the reform line of the priests. The line of the priests marks the rising up of the first angel at the time of the end. The first angel rises up. Elder Jeff Pippinger. Elder Jeff. 2014. Their first angel rises up. 
Uh, Malaika, Soka, Imidida. Michael Moore. Michael Moore. What's always the problem with the first angel? Uh, they don't understand the nature of the kingdom. Elder Jeff is going to lead this movement uh, Elder Jeff, from 1989 to 2014. And then in 2014, leadership changes. And you see this second set of leaders. Elder Jeff to Elder Paminda. Elder Jeff Ngachuka to Elder Paminda. So when you come to the line of the Nethanims, they must follow the same pattern. When we come to 2021, again their Sunday law way mark, their middle way mark. There must be a transition in leadership. Elder Jeff is the first angel. Michael Moore is the first angel. This movement of Nathanims is going to experience a transition of leadership in 2021. Will they know it? No. We didn't know it. It's built into the reform line. We took time, they will take time. <coughs> So who takes over leadership of the Nathanins? You know that when we get down to this history, there's a group of people, this movement, we're speaking to the Nathanims, we're telling them, you are in Babylon. You are in captivity to Babylon. You, are not com you have not come out. You need to leave Babylon and join this movement. So who's telling them where to go and what to do? We are. This movement becomes the leadership of the Nathanims in 2021, 18 months time. And you know that that's going to continue all the way to the close of probation. So whatever Michael Moore has to teach them, he's got 18 more months. 18. 18. 18. He has about a year. A year and a half of leading this group. And then it's going to transition from one to the other. From these leaders, Michael Moore, AOC, to this movement. What is it that Michael Moore doesn't understand about the kingdom? What's the problem? What is it about the kingdom that the first angel doesn't understand? Geography. It's all about geography. William Miller thought the sanctuary <coughs> was where? The earth. Elder Jeff, Elder Jeff, he thought this movement was a conservative American movement. Not a worldwide movement that would ever be led by quoting him 
European socialists. It was a movement focused and ran in America. His problem was nationalism, which is all about geography. So Michael Moore, people have lifted him up in this time period. In the whole movement of the Nethanims, as if they have everything understood. What's his problem with geography? Where does his kingdom exist? Earth. Where does our kingdom exist? Heaven. So Michael Moore's problem, he's leading a movement to set up a kingdom where? On this earth. So the part of his message that is incorrect is all about his incorrect model of geography. It seems like a, I think for some people, it seems like a small point. But it makes a massive amount of difference. Do you have to be Christian to follow any reforms, any rules, to be part of this earthly kingdom? No. People that are following this train of thought, some have gone so far as to say there is no heaven. It's all just a parable to try and describe what's going to happen on earth and heaven will be this earthly utopia. The, where this whole disagreement has begun is where people have seen these people doing the ploughing, the world, and they've put them on a pedestal, said they understand equality and freedom, and we don't. So they are 100% correct in their message. And this movement is half right and half wrong. I took my friend to the line of Christ. I asked her, was Christ half right and half wrong? The second angel in the history of success. She refused to accept that he represents the leadership in that time period. That his message represents the message of the movement in that time period. Which takes us right back to April this year, last year. Half right, half wrong. They're using the same logic, divorced from reform lines, divorced from reform lines. That Elder Jeff began using. So Michael Moore does not understand the nature of the kingdom. And that starts to change the requirements of being part of this kingdom. It starts changing your priorities. 
People are confused on this issue. Stop watching schools and camp meetings. And they're focused on his effort to fix the world. Like that's going to do any good. They're focusing on earthly issues. I'll give an example. Climate change. Is climate change real? Yes. Do you care? You care? I don't care. I don't care. This earth is not my home. This earth is not my kingdom. This earth will burn before the sea starts overflowing cities. I, I care about the present impact the one billion animals that just died in Australia. Because climate change just destroyed our country. But it is not the focus of my message. I'm not going to start sailing in a boat and not flying. Not going to do that. Because our whole focus is about the need to set up a kingdom in heaven. This earth is about to be destroyed. We want people to join us, but if they join us, they need to realize there will be no earthly kingdom. There is a present impact of climate change. I have sympathy for those suffering. It's very important we don't believe in conspiracy theories. But however subtle, do not let that draw your attention from the kingdom this movement is setting up to the earthly utopia of Michael Moore. So when you change our understanding of the location of the kingdom, it changes everything. I want to quote from a news article by The Guardian. The Guardian. By The Guardian. Michael Moore is being interviewed by Fox News. Sean Hannity. Sean Hannity asks talks to Michael Moore and says, admit it. Admit it. You're an unapologetic socialist. And Michael Moore says, no, I'm an unapologetic Christian. Moore says, I believe in Jesus. What Jesus taught. Sean Hannity says, So do I. 
Michael Moore then becomes specific. He says to Hannity, You're a Catholic. Hannity agrees. I'm Catholic. Michael Moore, Michael Moore is also a Catholic. Moore asks Hannity to tell him the subject of last Sunday's sermon. The theme that the Catholic Church had used. Sean, ha Sean Hannity is embarrassed because he doesn't know. And Michael Moore reminds him in the Catholic Church last Sunday the theme was about how hard it is for a rich man to go to heaven. Sean, ha Sean Hannity is Catholic. Steve Bannon is Catholic. But they follow Benedict. That's why they're conservative in complete agreement and union with Protestantism. Michael Moore is a firm Catholic. But he's a disciple of who? Francis. So September and October of 2018, he formalizes his message. Then he visits the Vatican in Rome. He meets with Pope Francis and receives a warm reception. And Michael Moore, Michael Moore says, Pope Francis says to Michael Moore, Papa Francis, Michael Moore, Michael Moore, you pray for me. Papa Francis, Michael Moore, Michael Moore, Sabira. <laughs> Wasn't sure if you're talking to me or to oh. <laughs> Don't understand that. <laughs> Pope Francis says to Michael Moore, Papa Francis, Michael Moore, pray for me. Sabira. Michael Moore says. Then you pray for me. And Francis says, No. You just keep making your documentaries. Keep doing that good job you're doing. Pope Francis knows Michael Moore and all that he does. Right at the formalization of the message, they are in union. So when you get down to this history, you have the rise of the papacy, you have Pope Francis, and Michael Moore. When we come down to the history of our calling out, you know this line is the separation of the stone from the mountain. This movement from Adventism, this is the separation of the wheat from the statue. Statue of Daniel 2. But when you come down to the dispensation of the calling out, the split happens inside the movement. Conservatives are long gone. Their structure. The mountain is long gone. The threat is inside. The threat in our calling out is do you want to follow the new leadership? 
or the first angel. That's what divided the movement. So for the Nethanims, in their calling out, in the Sunday law history, do they want to follow the new leadership or the first angel? The danger is internal. They must choose between this movement and Michael Moore because Michael Moore will choose the counterfeit. He already has. This shaking is between the first angel and the new leadership. This shaking is the same between the first angel and the new leadership. And the first angel, he is in union with Pope Francis and the counterfeit. So if someone wants to be an ethanim, if someone wants to become part of God's kingdom and they're on this reform line, their choice is not conservative versus liberals. The dangerous choice is between two groups that both identify as liberals. This movement or the papacy. It starts to change our understanding of the threat in the Sunday law history. So those understanding, coming with these understandings, if they follow that logic, all people have to do is accept equality. They have to reject that whole model. The lines of the counterfeit, the changes of leadership, the fact Michael Moore, Michael Moore will not be part of this movement. They're already saying I'm practicing predestination. Just by saying that, I'm not I'm doing line upon line. Line upon line shows that he won't. He's already working with the counterfeit. So what will make people choose us over the papacy? It has to be more than this. Can't be just equality. Want to come back to the history of Christ? His experience in the wilderness. In the wilderness, he's going to face three tests. These are the tests we understand we are going through right now. If you're going to read these in inspiration, you'll find them in two Gospels. Mark and Luke. Sorry, Matthew and Luke. Matthew or Luke? Read it from Matthew. 
If you want to understand the correct order of the temptations, Luke changes the order. But Ellen White clarifies what order those temptations came in. And it's the order given by Matthew. So I'll, I'll record a couple of quotes. CSA 32.6 CSA There might be a, a more original version. I haven't had time to go back through this. She says in, in this wilderness of temptation the destiny of the human race was at stake. Christ was then conqueror. Then she jumps to, she's describing the, the Gethsemane period. And she says, now Satan had come for the last fearful struggle. So in both histories, the destiny of the human race is at stake. Because Satan has found an avenue of attack. We read CTR 192.4. That's where she discusses the wilderness of temptation. Using the same language and references as the cross. The first temptation. If you turn to Matthew chapter 4. Starting, we can start from the beginning. Matthew chapter 4. <coughs> Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness <laughs> to be tempted of Satan. I want to remind us of Alan White's description <laughs> that adds more to this. <laughs> He'd gone into the wilderness <laughs> to consider his life work who he was as Christ and what was required of him, what path he was about to follow. Satan used that opportunity to try to turn him from his path. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights and he was hungry. Verse 3 And Satan came to him doesn't come looking like Satan. He doesn't show himself. He said, if, if you are the son of God command that these stones be made bread. So the first temptation is stones to bread. What do stones primarily represent in the Bible? The world. The people of the world. What does bread mean? It's life. It's the gospel. So Jesus is weak. Christo 
I'll write a message. We're more familiar with that definition. Jesus is weak. He'd seen at the baptism evidences of who he was. But after the baptism, he's fasting. There's no food. There's no message. After November 9, after 18 months of intense presenting, this movement went quiet. We had fin finished the message of the midnight cry. And in that quiet period, following that completion, people start to get hungry. And in that hunger, they're looking for a message. Where do they think they've learnt it from? Where do they think they've learnt it from? From the world. They need to teach us. They understand equality. They understand freedom. We don't. They're correct. We're half right and half wrong. I hope you start to see how all of those points directly contradict our reform lines. History of success. The nethanims are half right and half wrong. In our dispensation of the latter rain, which is the message of Christ, it's perfect. perfect. So the lines don't demonstrate that. But people have this idea. We are to learn from the world. And they take the concepts from the world and start trying to force that into a message. And whether openly or subtly, there's always the same premise. If you are who you say you are, if you're really the movement, you will accept our definition of freedom. If you're really different to FFA, you will accept our stone message. If Elder Paminda and Elder Tess are really the leaders, they will accept this message. Our message of liberalism and freedom as taught by the world. Which is why you see people posting images of people from the world speaking like famous actors speaking about freedom and then saying so much wrong with this movement if only we'd learn from the world if only we'd let the stones feed us and what does Christ say? no will not use our power as this movement as 144,000 to turn something that is not food into food to satisfy ourselves. And Satan showed himself with one word. If. if. The introduction of doubt that I see on chat rooms, 
More and more. The first angel equals the third angel. It seems innocent. What they're saying is if you're so different to Elder Jeff and those wicked conservative Protestants, you will enact our definition of freedom. You will remove yourself from the vows. The second test. Verse 5. Then the devil takes him into the holy city. He takes him to Jerusalem and sets him on the pinnacle of the temple and says, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down. So the second What he's saying is you can do something that would, should, you know, should normally hurt you. Should normally hurt you. But if you're the son of God, he will not let you be hurt. This is the sin of presumption. If you're the son of God, he shall give his angels charge over you. And they will protect you from the fall in case what hurts you. What would hurt you? The stones. So you can put yourself knowingly in a situation where the stones are going to hurt you. And God won't let them hurt you. And what do the stones represent? The world. So you can throw yourself at the stones as much as you like, can't hurt you. Application. The mindset that Ellen White's instructions about music, what a strong beat does to your mind. What the music of the world does to your mind. Is that dispensational? Did your mind suddenly change from her day to our day? Where worldly music in her day didn't hurt. And in some, t some way in our day it won't hurt. She talks about fiction. Reading fiction. Watching theater. It was dangerous for our salvation in her day. Can we safely watch movies, worldly movies in our day? The mind, that the concept that they're saying is that those worldly things, it's the speaking of the stones, 
I don't mean the, the good speaking. It's the actions of the stones. The practices of the world. That will not hurt us. We can watch worldly movies, listen to worldly music, eat worldly food, and we're safe. Won't impact our salvation because it's not the test of equality. And if we're the movement, God will protect us. We can throw ourselves at it. And the stones can't hurt. I'd refer back to the school where Elder Paminda spoke about the nature of man and how these subjects impact our salvation. We could go further into that, but we won't for time. What the foot represents. But we'll move on. The whole concept, I can do what hurts me. I can pierce my ears. Listen to worldly mu music. Watch worldly movies. None of those stones can hurt me. Could go further into that, but we won't for time. Back to Matthew chapter 4. Starting in verse 5. Uh, sorry, down to verse 8. So in verse 7, Jesus says, you will not tempt God. You won't watch something that he would ne need to protect you from. Thinking he will. You won't eat something. You won't listen to something, thinking God will protect you. God cannot protect us from the consequences of our own choices. Verse 8. Satan takes him into a high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he says, All this I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Satan shows himself. Shows himself. He reveals who he is because Satan is trying to set up a kingdom based where in geography? On this earth. And he says to Christ, if you'll just worship me, if you follow me, if you follow my counterfeit, you can be part of this. You can be part of this earthly empire. Just join me. Kiss my feet. Surrender to my counterfeit liberalism. And Christ says, My kingdom is not this world. I'm not trying to set up some utopia on earth based on socialist principles 
It's all about freedom and the environment. At this point in time, when victory is won, Satan flees. Jesus is hit with three temptations. He's gone into the wilderness to consider his mission. And the effort of Satan is to turn from that mission. To cause him to doubt who he was. To turn from the path. And it all seemed positive. You say you're the son of God. Feed yourself from the stones. You say you're the son of God. Throw yourself at them. They can't hurt you. And then all pretense leaves. If you want success, join the side of the counterfeit. They have a nice liberation theology. They have a nice counterfeit liberalism. And focus on setting up a kingdom that is not heavenly. We're about out of time. We only have a few minutes left. So I just want us to consider what God means by freedom. We'll go to two prior histories. There won't be time to develop this point appropriately. But I'll, I'll introduce it for your consideration. We understand in the triple application of prophecy which is 1850 plus 1888 equals the Sunday law. Come back to 1850. You have the sin of the United States from the time of the end. 1798 through to 1850 their cup is filled God's ready to judge them and what is the external test? Slavery it is the test of that history <laughs> Come to 1888. The cup is filled. Their sin is what issue? Sunday. Enforcement. We take these issues. We come down to the Sunday law and say church plus state and the issue of equality. This is the external test. It's the test of that reform line. Sunday enforcement is the test of 1888. 
Equality. Equality. Oversimplification. Test of our Sunday law. You go back to 1850. They're going to begin to reach the world. The beginning of the loud cry of the third angel. Ellen White says, we need to take a message to them. Is that message based on slavery? There was lots of good Protestants who rejected slavery. Protestants in the north they rejected slavery. Did they obtain the kingdom of God? No. You fail to obtain the kingdom even if they're on the right side of slavery. Instead, they were given the 1850 chart. Uh, Everything on that chart were the truths that God had given to his people since the time of the end. And if they want to be part of the kingdom of God, slavery isn't the only test of membership. It is the peculiar test of that dispensation. But it is not the only test of membership. Eighteen eighty-eight. Lots of good people are saying we should not enforce Sunday. I might keep Sunday, but we shouldn't have a law about it. We shouldn't enforce it. They never become Adventists, but they reject the Sunday. Do they become part of the kingdom of God? No. It is the test of that history. But not the only test of membership. So we come down to our history. Is it enough for Pope Francis in this history? Of the Sunday law. To say, I reject the inequality of Donald Trump. I believe in equality. Does Pope Francis become part of the kingdom of God? No. None of them do. People can accept equality and fail to enter the kingdom. I want to read a couple of quotes. Six testimony. Three, five, six. Point four. It's only one sentence, I'll just paraphrase. It means eternal salvation to keep the Sabbath holy. God says, Then that honour me, I will honour. Then that honour me, I will honour. So in 1888, it was not enough to keep, to, to reject the Sunday, Sunday law. 
you have Protestants or you have a Protestant. saying you have to keep the Sunday, Sunday law or you will die. It's the conclusion it was heading towards. What does Adventism say? What does Ellen White say? You will keep the Sabbath or you will die. Does that sound like freedom? That's the problem people have. It doesn't sound like freedom. But you can't just reject the Sunday law. You have to fulfill the requirements of God. And then if you wanted to be successful in that history, what test was they, were they given? 1888 conference they weren't arguing about the Sunday law. What doctrine? Righteousness by faith. There's more required to be part of God's people than to be on the right side of the external test. One more quote. First Testimonies 326.1 So this is, don't get waylaid by the date. It's already history of failure, but it's written in 1861. She says, different churches and families were presented before me. So God is showing her something. He's bringing towards her some different churches and families. Different influences have been exerted. Satan and there have been discouraging results so people have exerted different influences and the results have been discouraging Satan has used as agents Individuals professing to believe a part of present truth while they're warring against a part. So there's a part that believe present truth. So there's a people that believe a part of present truth. And they fight against another part. He can use those people more effectively than those that are at war with all of our faith. This has deceived and distracted many. This has scattered their faith. This has caused division. As some receive a part of the message and reject another portion. Some accept the Sabbath. 
and reject the third angel's message. Yet because they have received the Sabbath, they claim the fellowship of those who believe all of present truth. Then they labor to bring others into the same dark position as themselves. They are not responsible to anyone. They have an independent faith of their own. So there are people who believe that they're safe because they accept one part of present truth. And in that history, the Sabbath is present truth. But it's not the only thing. And people feel safe in accepting a part. When we come to our history, the 144,000 what makes us special is that we have the ability not because we're clever because we were born here that we can look back and learn from years. We can bring to ourselves all of the truths we have the increase of knowledge on so many subjects. And it is a misreading of inspiration it's a complete separation from reform lines to believe we can be part of the kingdom of God purely by passing that test. I'll paraphrase one final quote. 7MR 216.3 She's speaking, she'd spoken on Sabbath. And she's giving some summary of her idea of that meeting. Everyone's there. And she says, not one of us were forced to receive salvation. We could receive it if we wanted to. We could choose life or death. Many wish for life, but they don't choose it. They love the world, its fashion, its pleasure. And they plainly show they have not chosen eternal life. Their treasure is here. This world is their home. I will rephrase that. This world is their kingdom. What freedom does what freedom does God give us? Our freedom is one simple choice. Do you want to live or do you want to die? That might not sound like freedom. But that's the freedom God offers. Because if you live without his rules, you will not want to live for eternity. You will be miserable. You will make others miserable. He offered Adam and Eve that freedom. Complete freedom to live or die. It wasn't a choice between living your way or living his way. 
which is the freedom that people in this movement are expecting. We can see clearly that there will be two groups that will form in the history of the Sunday law. Both can identify as liberals. Depending on how you define that term. Because when we talk about conservatives and liberals in the world, Fox News versus CNN, Fox News, CNN. they are liberal and conservative. They dress the same. They wear the same makeup. The same earrings. They watch the same movies. They listen to the same music. So when we talk about liberals and conservatives in their ploughing, we're not talking about reforms. What divided a liberal from a conservative is an understanding of the worth of a human being. That all that we took from the model of liberal versus conservative. Liberals say every human being has equal worth. Conservatives say they do not have equal worth. Their worth changes based, based on the color of their skin, based on their gender, based on their sexual preference. That's the difference between a conservative and a liberal. Not what they wear. But we know those liberals, they're already working in step with the papacy. There is never worth in a counterfeit document. So let us not think that this liberal papacy has any worth to us. In the time period of the harvest, the first angel becomes the enemy. Michael Moore Pope Francis. People will choose between them and between us. You have to consider what makes us different to the papacy. Because at this stage, it's not equality. We must have something else to offer them. It's not enough to believe slavery is wrong, to become part of the kingdom of God. All truth had to be gathered up, presented and accepted. 1888, it's not just Sunday. You have to keep the Sabbath. You have to be baptized. You have to accept the prophet. When you accept the prophet, you accept her counsel on diet. On dress. On adornment. And then you have the whole doctrine of righteousness by faith. Which is another way of saying the nature of man. So we are coming into a serious problem when people say at the Sunday law there's this one external test and everyone that passes that can be part of the kingdom. We've been through the last great battle as a chiasm, a chiasm of Christ. You had his 
first battle and his last battle. You come to this priesthood. And it's a chiasm. His last battle, then his first battle. Each battle, in each battle, the great controversy is at stake. All is lost if Christ surrenders for te to the temptation. We've been through this battle. It's all about the nature of the kingdom. Judas says, this kingdom is on earth. And Christ says, that's not the type of kingdom I'm setting up. The movement splits. You come to this battle. It's just as serious. Just as serious. Just as dangerous. And it's about the nature of the kingdom. He's trying to tempt Christ to lose his identity. God has clearly showed him the blood-stained path he's about to tread. That is not one of serving himself. And Satan's message, the first test, is serve yourself. Use who you are to feed yourself. It's a turning from Christ's mission. Throw yourself at the stones. They can't hurt you now. Because you said you are the true movement. If you are, if you're the true leaders, if this is the true movement, then we will accept the stones feed us and the stones can't hurt us. Third, geography. This is geography. This is geography. Earthly kingdom. And Christ says, my kingdom is not here. So I'm concerned for people's welfare. I care about their health. Health. Their health. I care about the environment. But that does not distract us. Many people in this movement, they're not understanding these things. They're innocently confused. Others are not so innocent. They do know better. And they're challenging who we are. Satan is trying to get us to forget our identity. As this movement of Seventh-day Adventists and all that that means, 6,000 years of restoration on every level. Our only safety is by knowing where we are on reform lines and trusting them. God has led 
He has taught us. He has told us the blood-stained path we're about to tread. He's given us the true nature of the kingdom. We cannot be turned from that. Or the entire great controversy is lost. If you kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we see that you raised this movement up, Lord, to do a specific work. It's serious, Lord, the work that must be done. Father, the salvation of so many people, many of whom don't know you exist, it hangs in the balance based on our faithfulness. I pray, Lord, that we will be faithful. We know that this movement is a history of success. We know this movement will accomplish the work with or without us. But Lord, we dearly request that it's with us. Not just us kneeling before you, but the people we love. We do not stop to love those who disagree with us. We still love those who have left us in the past dispensation, let alone those who are dividing from us now. Lord, may they know that they are loved, but that we fear for their souls. May none of us lose our identity of who we are as a people, of what you require of us, of what we mean represent to the world. I pray, Father, that we will keep our object clearly before us and understand the self-sacrifice that comes with this work. Lord, I pray that you will help individuals through this time period, that many of us as possible may exit this time period on the right side. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.